the wonderful world of fighting games. Loads of characters, loads of moves, and inevitably, loads of different matchups. The thing is, some characters are going to match against others where their toolkit just works absolute wonders, leaving the opponent in a situation where the odds are against them even before the first attack has been landed. Matchups can range from even, slightly disadvantage or advantage, and then you enter the dreaded 7 3 and beyond, where a matchup is so challenging that you need to be a master of the character to still have a good chance at seeing success. Now, for clarity, even a bad matchup can be won, it's just going to be way harder than if the matchup was even. With Mortal Kombat and Injustice, there have been some key matchups that were notoriously difficult to win. The thing is that we've still been able to see players conquer the odds and see success. It's a great storyline and definitely a crowd pleaser when that happens. But more commonly, it doesn't. And that's where today's video comes into play. I want to look into specific matchups in this one because it does feel like low hanging fruit to just go low tier versus top tier. I want to capture a few with more moving parts than just good character versus bad character. That's a bit too easy. We are Ketchup and Mustard, and these are five matchups in Mortal Kombat and Injustice that are extremely difficult to conquer in the world of competitive play. If you like what you see, feel free to throw us a like and subscription. You know, the usual stuff that helps people out here on YouTube would definitely appreciate it. Number 5. Injustice 2 – Captain Cold vs Catwoman Now, Sonic Fox has always been arguably the game's biggest innovator, at least in the game's prime time where it was the current main title for NRS games. Fox was able to use many characters less looked into by the scene to achieve great success, and possibly the biggest example of that roster of characters was their world-class Captain Cold, a character who was rarely used standalone, but served more of a purpose to counterpick popular characters that you'd see in tournament play quite often. Those characters could include the likes of The Flash, Robin, and in today's video, Catwoman. Now, all three of these characters, and even more, could be mentioned as having a bit of a hard time against Captain Cold, but with just how often we saw Samij and other Catwoman players fight Sonic Fox, where the Captain Cold came out to play, is a bit too apparent to not include on today's video. Captain Cold excelled as a character if the opponent had to play his game. This would often involve characters that do not have a strong full screen check to stop Cold from charging up trait and setting up various traps that they don't want to have to deal with later. Injustice 2 had extremely large stages for fighting game standards, and even the characters are kind of small in comparison. This would naturally help full screen play across the board, but a character like Captain Cold, who simply needed space to get going, could take full advantage of this. When the character got going, however, it was an absolute disaster of projectiles, ground freezes, and importantly, a trait that could give Captain Cold a few different options. One popular one being a buff that would damage enemies in his vicinity, but most notably a giant icy orb that did damage and would freeze an opponent who's inside of it for too long. Oh yeah, and it slows them down as well. The reason Captain Cold gave trouble to characters who had to come to him is that it was way easier for him to get going and start applying all of this crazy stuff that the characters would struggle to deal with. Catwoman may have been a very strong character with long range on her normals, but she couldn't really do anything once the icy sphere was on screen, or even in worse situations where the aura was paired with Captain Cold's weird damage over time projectile. There were situations in tournament where there was genuinely nothing a Catwoman player could do to fight back, and it would eventually lead to counterpick wars where other characters might have been necessary to stop what Captain Cold was trying to do here. Number 4. Mortal Kombat 9 – Johnny Cage vs Jax Now, Jax is a really good character in MK9. He's one of the few characters that has access to a reset combo situation that bags touch of death scenarios in the corner. Simply loop a specific knockdown into enhanced ground pound and rinse repeat for as long as you have meter to do so. The reason Jax was never higher up on a tier list, even with the damage he has access to, is the existence of some really difficult and rather common matchups. The most notorious for this character was often Johnny Cage for a number of reasons. It sounds weird, right? You look at a rushdown character like Jax and you'd automatically assume that his worst matchup were those that could zone him out all day and keep him from getting in. 
Well, in the case of Jax, his bad matchups were often due to specific details surrounding his hitboxes, and Johnny Cage was one of those picks that was able to nullify some of his absolute strongest tools. The big factor here is that Jax's main pressure string was his forward 4-1. Four one. Forward 4-1-3 four is a knockdown and in the corner leads to the meter burn ground pound reset combos. Here's the issue. A specific number of characters were able to make the second hit of forward 4-1 four whiff on block, opening Jax up for punishment and makes the string itself almost unusable. It was a simple matter of how low a character was to the ground when in their crouch blocking state. The further down to the ground they were, the better chance they had of making this string miss completely. Cage wasn't the only one that made it miss. Melina could do it, Sonya and Sector could do it, even Cabal could, because of course he can, but Cage was the most irritating example because it didn't end there. On top of nullifying the main string that Jax wants to use in a match, Cage's buttons, like his god tier forward 3 mid, would pretty much beat out any button in the neutral that Jax wanted to use in his advance, and he also didn't have an amazing time at dealing with Cage's rushdown when Cage finally got his offense going, and due to the simplicity of Johnny Cage on a basic level, he was a popular pocket pick people would use against a Jax specialist when they knew the matchup was inbound. It didn't end at the close range game either, Cage's projectiles were just good enough to deal with Jax's ones, and shut down the ground pound at range due to how the projectile that Cage throws arcs downwards and hits Jax regardless. When you look at a player like EGP Tyrant, who at the time was said by many to be the best Jax, or definitely one of them, he would have to fight against Cage all the time, and to be fair, was able to see success in some of those matchups, but it was always discussed at being potentially one of the game's harder matchups overall. You had to work so hard. Number 3. Mortal Kombat 11 – Shiva Stomp vs. Poor Movement I'm cheating a little bit here by not mentioning a single character, but trust me, this is significant enough that it's worth mentioning on today's list. During the short-lived period of enhanced drag and drop in MK11 being way better than it is now, there were some characters that had little to no answers against it, which resulted in pocket picks from character specialists simply being forced in competitive play. I don't want to talk about the pre-patch stomp too much because, potential hot take here, I actually think at high level this move was a bit blown out of proportion. Shiva's scariest moves at the time were, in my opinion, the fireball stance and the low scoop back when she had a thousand health, and at the highest level of play, the risk versus reward of a stomp was never in her favor. The punish damage she takes was way higher than the 10 or so percent a single stomp would lead to, and many characters did have certain answers for it. I'm saying this as someone that commentated pre-patch Shiva way more than anyone else at the time, and I lost count of how many times a player would be down in a set, go to Shiva as if it's going to magically win, and lose instantly. This was the likes of Pro Competition, Sony's weekly open series, the Stomp lost players' sets a ton more than it won in my experience, however, it definitely needed to be nerfed as it was completely ruining the experience for every other level of player, and that was not a good thing. It did need to be changed. For today's list though, the bad matchups were in instances where a tiny amount of characters still could not stop the stomp from hitting them, and this lied in characters with extremely poor movement, particularly those with terrible dashes. They simply did not have the movement required to make the stomp miss, and if they had a special move that could reposition them, it would put them really far away so they still couldn't punish Shiva. I'm talking about characters like Noob Cybot or Collector. Their movement was so slow that consecutive if stomps were still a real threat, and even if players were aware that it was as good as it was, they still didn't have a lot of options to actually shut it down. This unfortunately did result in matchups where the odds were totally against a player using one of those characters, and it was common that a character change was completely necessary, and when a character forces you to change yours, that is a bad matchup in its purest example. The stomp we have now doesn't really give the same level of challenge, thankfully. Number 2. Mortal Kombat 9 – Kenshi vs Jade I know I said at the start of this video that I was going to avoid a simple case of low tier vs top tier, but this is not one of those cases. There are some key examples in this matchup that ignores tiers completely, and it simply exists as a standalone, famous, awful matchup. Kenshi is one of the best zoners in the entire game, and that is also something that makes him so overwhelming. Before the DLC characters existed, your keepaway characters on paper were the likes of Reptile, Noob Cybot, 
even Striker. Players that had projectile options but didn't exactly keep you away to an overwhelming effect for an entire round. The DLC added Kenshi and Freddy and this was where it would change. And what's a good move for avoiding projectiles? Well, it's Jade's glow. It's the strongest thing about her, arguably, and even though she's a weak character overall, being able to bypass many projectiles in the game was at least some kind of a saving grace in some of the matchups. The opponent had to at least be thinking about it, and that's better than nothing. Not Kenshi, it turns out, as Kenshi is one of the few characters that, although is a projectile-focused character, his ranged attacks seemingly do not count as one, because whether it's the rising karma or the spirit charge, they will completely ignore Jade's glow and hit her anyway, making her strongest special, in theory, completely useless. What if Jade wants to use enhanced glow to simply armor through these moves? She can, but she takes massively increased damage in that state, and even a wake-up enhanced Kenshi shoulder does enough damage that should she get a full combo for armoring through it, she will barely break even with the damage that she just took. Removing the glow in this matchup is a grade A nightmare, because without it, your projectiles are far too slow to compare with Kenshi's, her options to advance are incredibly weak compared to other characters, and the biggest issue is her lack of damage output. You can get okay damage in training mode for certain moves opening the combo, but in a real match, it's just so unlikely that Jade gets the opportunity to do it. She has to spend tons of meter if she wants to get Glaive pressure on Enhanced, and even then, you constantly have to worry about Kenchi's armor sending you full screen again. This game had few matchups that the community would argue is an 8-2 situation, but when the discussion took place, Jade vs Kenshi would often pop up in conversation. It was simply that bad. Number 1 in Justice Gods Among Us, General Zod vs Lex Luthor. Okay, some of you must have known this was coming. This is the most famous bad matchup in all of the Netherrealm era. A matchup so terrible that it gets talked about time and time again. It is absolutely atrocious. The clip that often goes around on the internet involves Revolver, who in this game was the best Lex Luthor player. Absolutely. This player had really good results with the character, put in tons of work, had tons of cool tech, and on a matchup level knew so many small details that it would make Revolver a serious threat in competitive play. The tournament in question was NEC 15, and it was in the top 16. Revolver had won a bunch of games to get here, so we were in a high stakes situation. The issue is, when encountering Zod players, this would change so much because the matchup was just so bad. Think of one of the best zoners you've ever seen in a fighting game. Then think of a character so big that they struggle with zoning in general. Put the two together and you have Zod versus Lex Luthor. But truthfully, I don't think this matchup has been really broken down all that much for as often as this clip has been seen by the fighting game community. So here goes. The more obvious thing is Zod's keep away. His projectiles can be done instantly in the air. You can use absolutely loads of them and they travel really slowly meter burn them to cover different angles that Lex would use to close in space, like jumping or dashing forward. He has grounded projectiles that are a lot faster, and they serve as a means to shut down Lex's trait, which is a single hit of armor, and the projectiles that Lex might try and use himself to create some breathing room, like the little orbs he throws, or the laser strike, or the missile strike. The most efficient versions of these projectiles that Lex uses come from his own meter burn, which obviously costs meter to use. Issue is, if you use too much meter to try and get in, you have nothing left to turn any of your hits into a full combo, which results in very small damage output. So you can't spend it all, because what do you do when you get in? One of the biggest issues that Lex faces while walking in is the Zod trait that can keep you stuck in block stun and the eye laser that does tons of chip damage and pushes you back to, you guessed it, full screen. Lex Luthor cannot jump or dash. He has to painstakingly walk his way in, looking for one key opportunity to score a knockdown. And with that knockdown, you have to make sure everything goes to plan. If it doesn't, and Zod gets away even once, you are right back to where you started. The only time Lex has a single chance in this matchup is point blank. 
but getting point blank is 80% of the struggle. Lex is one of the largest characters, with one of the floatiest jumps. His armor trait is the one thing that can give a fighting chance for him, but even then, Zod has so many moves that hit multiple times that you can power through that trait with relative ease. You wanna know what's funny about that NEC tournament clip though? Revolver actually won a game there. Ugh. Oh, that matchup just hurts to watch. And there we have it! Some notoriously difficult matches in competitive Mortal Kombat and Injustice. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Stay tuned for a lot more to come, and I will see you next time. Take care.